Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for this evening's meditation is taken from the Gospel lesson just previously read. I'm a fan of a story where a person is facing a bully, and his or her situation seems really hopeless, only to have some kind of a hero arrive on the scene and stand in the gap, stand against the bully, whip the bully, save the helpless person. That's why I like the text from today's sermon, from today's gospel lesson, because it's really good to have somebody stand in the gap when we're engaged in a fight that none of us can win. And I want you to know that we have that someone in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In today's lesson, we see Jesus as he stands up for us. He stands up for you, and he stands up for me, and he stands up for all mankind. He stands in the place of sinners from the very beginning of his ministry. He took our place by standing up for those, for us, in the baptismal waters of the Jordan River. You see, as Jesus stepped into the water to be baptized by John, he chose, he chose to stand with us. He does not need a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but he insists on being baptized anyway, so that, as he said, all righteousness might be fulfilled. You see, as he stepped in those waters, the righteous man that he was, he chose to identify himself with sinners. Scripture tells us that John's baptism was a baptism for repentance. This baptism was meant for people who needed the forgiveness of God, for those who needed their sins washed away. And so John objected when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, saying, Jesus, I, I need to be baptized by you. And you're coming to me? See, I'm the one who needs repentance, John says. Not you. You're the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John is absolutely right. This one who enters the Jordan River is the spotless Lamb of God. He came to redeem. He was the one that was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin. <laughs> Jesus is without sin. He's done nothing wrong. He doesn't need to be baptized. You see, he's the only one, Jesus is the only one, who has ever come, or who will ever come, to the waters of baptism who is absolutely <coughs> pure and righteous in and of himself. So then exactly why did he come to the waters of baptism? He came to those waters on that day because those whom he created in his own image, us, we face foes too strong to overcome Jesus came to the waters of baptism to publicly begin a fight against sin and death. He came to the waters of baptism because we are unable to fight this fight. He's the hero in this story. He was taking the place of all sinners. And so he was baptized as a sinner. He was identifying himself with us poor, miserable sinners that we are. But instead of having to have his sins washed away, it's though when he stepped into the waters of the Jordan, the sin of the world is being washed onto him. So that he could bear those sins to the cross. And quite frankly, that's why God the Father sent our Lord Jesus into the world to stand in the place of sinners. 
say, God was pleased with Jesus. We know this. Because after Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened and the voice comes down from heaven. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And God spoke the word, the words, this is my son, my beloved son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. And witnesses heard this. So we know this. See, God was pleased with Jesus because Jesus kept the law of God absolutely, perfectly. He didn't just try. He didn't just give it his best. He kept it perfectly, never breaking a commandment, not even once in his entirety of his <coughs> life. He was completely obedient, and he was and he pleased the Father by willingly <coughs> taking our sins on him in body, in his body, and then pouring out his very life blood on the cross to atone for those sins. For God has been very clear, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so you and I. At best, we stand before our God and we confess to Him that we're by nature, we're sinful and we're unclean. See, that's our natural state. We are sinful and we are unclean. And if we are sinful and unclean, which Scripture is very clear about telling us that we are, then we can't get anywhere near God because God can't tolerate sin. You see, to be in the presence of God, you have to be 100% perfect. Not 80%, not 90, not 60, not 99.999, but 100. To be in the presence of God. That's an impossible task. You can't be, I can't be, nobody. And so we confess to our Father in heaven, for the sake of your Son, have mercy on us. Because there's no other reason that he should. And God answers us by proclaiming that, that he has given his only Son to die for us, and for the sake of that Son, Jesus. He forgives us all of our sins. See, Jesus stood in our place and he took away our sin so we too can experience God's favor. Despite our sinfulness, we can live in God's presence because Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. And God was pleased to accept that as an offering, an atonement. But how do you know for sure? How do you know for sure that we have peace with God? After all, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, right? He did. <clears throat> Yet, we know that all people are not saved. So how can we be sure? How can you and I be sure that this salvation is for us? Well, we can know because we have the promises of God. Paul says, God saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. You see, those of us who have been baptized have been washed with water in the word. Our sins were washed off of us and onto Jesus, just as if we were physically present in the Jordan River on that day that Jesus stepped into it to be baptized. And he carried our sins to the cross. And so God can pronounce us forgiven. It's important for us to remember. It's really important for us to remember because at 
best, even on our most fantastic days, our faith is weak. experience hurt at the hands of enemies, but more importantly, we experience hurt by the hands of the ones that we love the most. We suffer. We suffer guilt and shame and embarrassment for things that we do. And many suffer in silence their whole entire lives, praying that people never find out that secret sin or sins in their life. But we don't have to be like that in front of our God because there's nothing hidden from Him. And there's nothing too vile or too gross that Jesus didn't take it to the cross with Him. We have God's Word. And that word is in and with the water of holy baptism, which washed away your sins, giving you a new birth in Christ. In our epistle today, read a little earlier, Paul writes, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So unlike the false teachings of many of my evangelical brethren, this is not a verse about when you were baptized, so therefore you've been given some kind of superpower to not sin anymore. And if you are sinning, well then you're just not using your powers correctly. This is a verse to prove that because God has promised that he's united you with Jesus in <coughs> baptism to his death and resurrection. That's how you know you belong to God because God said so. Not because you remember everything about your baptism. Not because when you made some commitment some long time ago that God loves you. God loves you for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. And only for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. I hate to tell you, but if you hold up the mirror of the law in front of your face, the only thing you're going to see is putridness. There's nothing good in us, people. Oh, I know, we all look civilly good on the outside, and we do some nice things, and we give to charities, and, you know, perhaps we've been married a long time, or, you know, whatever. That's, that's good, and that's commendable. Those are all good things. But in the economy of God, even pagans do that stuff. See, baptism connects us to our Savior, connects us to his death and his life. And since Christ has defeated that sin and death, that we are able to walk in his forgiveness, even though we are still living in this body of sin. We still live in this body of sin. And we all know, even when we try really hard, we just can't quit it. You know, on the same week where you say, boy, this week, I, I'm going to be really good to my kids this week. I'm not going to go off on them. Or I'm going to be really nice to my husband. or be really nice to my wife. I'm not going to scream at the driver in front of me this week. You might make it a day or two. But you know what? At the end of the day, we're all selfish beings. We're full of sin. And we see that all the time. So I want to give you some more good news. Not only do you know that you're connected to God through Christ Jesus in baptism, and God has promised that, but you know that Jesus now advocates for us at the right hand of God. 
So he's not looking at you going, oh, look at you. Oh, did you see that? I mean, how many times do I got to forgive you? My goodness sakes, how many times are you going to do that? Thank God he doesn't do that. Thank God that in his death he accomplished everything and he took them away. And we read in our in opening invocation, as far as the east is from the west is our sin removed from us. You know, God is in some kind of religious policeman like a lawyer who is... You know, has this quiver full of your sins sitting back here, just in case he needs them to slap you down. He doesn't do that. So if you hear that kind of guilt coming on your brain, that's not coming from God. And the Jordan River, Jesus identified himself with us. And he took our sin. In our baptism, we have received the gifts that Jesus gives as he defeated life, or as he defeated sin and death to give us life. That's what we get. That's what we have. Without that, we'd be overcome. We cannot beat sin. Look around, you can't beat death either. I thank God we have lots of good medicine and Doctors that can give us stuff to help keep our bodies going, but look, folks, we're not beating it. It's coming for all of us. Even those of us who belong to God, we thank God for those of us who belong to God through Christ Jesus. This world is not the end of the story, and our broken bodies are not defining. That's good news. That's really good news. So consider yourselves, <clears throat> consider yourselves dead to sin because you are. And consider yourselves alive to Christ because he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's a fact. This world is hard. This life is hard. Take the promises of God and run them. It's such a nice thing. Look at His word and His promises. Don't look at your circumstances. Because one day they're good and the next day they're not. Just look at God's word and believe it. That's why He tells us these things. So we can believe. And have joy. And it is in that joy and peace and comfort in the hearing of his word that I pray that his peace may abide upon all of you. <clears throat> that peace, that peace that surpasses our human understanding. I pray that that peace would guard your hearts and your minds in the good times and in the bad times in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.